Have you ever had that moment of your day where you're just, I don't know, walking out of the house and suddenly last thing's millage pops into your head or maybe, you know, Jose Valentine or Julio Franco just comes to mind as you're walking through the supermarket. Those Mets legends of the past, those, those obscure names that we might forget and then they hit you with a wave of nostalgia. That is the entire point of Mets Legends, which is founded by my guy, Rob Pearsall. We work together at Metsmerized, and he is on today for a Throwback Thursday to discuss his site and to talk about some names from the past that will surely put a smile on your face. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So I'm excited today for a throwback Thursday to bring on a good friend of mine. He's been a guest before and he's going to be a recurring guest on our throwback Thursdays because he has One of the coolest sites out there if you're a Mets fan. One of my absolute favorite follows on Twitter, which is Mets Legends. Basically, what Rob does is he's just going to pepper you with those names from the past that you've forgotten about or even the the classic legends we all know and love. And uh, just really brings you back to a special time if you're a Mets fan. Puts a smile on my face anytime uh, I see some of the great work they're doing. So first of all, thank you for joining me, Rob. And uh, why don't you tell uh, the audience again uh, how Mets Legends started? Sure. Well, thank you, Ryan, for having me on. Uh, you know, the feeling is mutual. You know, you're a good buddy of mine and uh, always having some good content pumping out. Your podcast is great, so I'm happy to be a guest on here. Um, but, yeah, so Mets Legends started um, kind of just from seeing people on Twitter and Reddit and whatever referring to guys that are not legends as legends um so i always thought that was like really funny um and it's something that like kind of has been going on for a while but i remember back on like the early days of mets twitter like the early 2010s um every once in a while there would just be these threads of people saying like name that met name that random met you know and then it would just be guys you totally forget about and then you see some guys and you really just crack up because you haven't thought about them in a long time um and i always liked that and then so I made a Twitter account a few years ago, just called random Mets players. And of course that just rolls off the tongue. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not clunky at all, but, uh, it got, it got a pretty decent following. You know, I gained a couple thousand followers and people liked it and it was simple. I mean, each day I would just like post a picture of a, of a random Met, and, you know, that was that. And then as I was kind of, uh, advancing, I, I, I realized that I wanted to do more with it. And so, Random Mets, uh, random Mets players turned into Mets legends just because that's what you would hear people like referring to it as. And I was like, no one's doing this. No one's made a, a site or an account about this. So uh, I might as well. And uh, I was doing kind of the same thing, um, posting pictures and people were into it. I'd get suggestions in my inbox of, uh, of legends people would want to see. Um, and then I wanted to kind of like bolster it a little bit. And I put a feeler out for if anyone wanted to do like some like graphic design work for me, you know, just making like quick graphics on if it was like a player's birthday or, you know, like a legend of the day, so to say. And uh, the first person to reach out to me is now my 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 podcast host, uh, my, my co-host, uh, Michael Jennings. And uh, he's become a really good friend of mine and uh, great podcast co-host and he was like the first person to do some 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 graphics for us um and then i was still with mesmerize at the time we were both editing over there at that point um and then it kind of just got to the point where you know i wanted to do my own thing and i had some ideas of like wanting to run a site of my own and so i pretty much pivoted to that uh bought the rights to metslegends.com which no one had done um and so yeah, that was kind of that was kind of me advancing, and I'm kind of where I'm at now. I have some some guys that uh, were over at Metsmerize with me, helping me out with some graphic design stuff. I'm doing the podcast still, and uh, you know, pumping out some articles on things that 
I like to talk about that maybe aren't being talked about in regards to the Mets so often. So that's kind of the, 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 the story of Mets legends. Yeah. It's it, like I said, it's, it's a great follow on Twitter. It's a great site to go check out the articles you're doing. The podcast is great. I've been on there as well. So I, I really do appreciate uh, having you as a part of locked on Mets now uh, where we can talk about Mets legends, because I think that is uh, certainly something that will put a, a smile on my audience's face where we could just, go back in time and uh, you know this past week was the anniversary i believe of carlos gomez's return uh which i saw you you guys tweeting stuff out that the great uh it was it was that first game back that he hit the walk off correct i don't know i don't know if it was the first game back um but it was definitely like like one of the first games back um and yeah i i remember that that's where they, they had a four game series with the nationals and uh, that's when you had like Rajay Davis yep. back up and uh, Aaron Altair was like, like, like following in suit and then Gomez. So you had like the, the, I call it like the OG bench mob, like the, like the <laughs> original bench mob uh, kind of stepping up to the plate and Gomez was right in the center of that. So it's, it seems like every year we get, especially just because thinking of 2019 and then this past year, like that stretch of this just random wave of legends that will that will come across our screen during a time of injury. Like this past year, it was you know when when everyone went down and Cameron Mabin uh, made his great great Mets legends career of uh, you know whatever it was like nineteen strikeouts and thirty something at bats. He only got on base once and it was uh, or he only got a hit once and it was an infield hit. Uh, yeah. You know there was there's so many this past year and Gomez. That was a really fun one because it was the, the the combination of a previous legend who had a brief Mets career, was traded for Johan Santana, mm-hmm. and then had also you know the 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 near coming back with with the uh, the 2015 Mets, and who knows if that team even makes it to the World Series if they trade for Gomez instead of Cespedes. Yeah, and then uh, yee 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 <laughs> comes yeah, back it. <laughs> comes back into our life. Oh man, and even the, the home run trot. I, I again, if you go to Mets Legends, they tweeted out a video of it. The home run trot that it is the most ridiculous home run trot you will ever see when he hits that walk off. He like makes this weird symbol as he like watches yeah. it, guides <laughs> it out. He, it's it's crazy. Like Carlos Gomez, man, what a character. You, you you kind of wish that he spent his whole career with the Mets, and then it's also kind of perfect that he didn't. Yeah, exactly. It is like you kind of wonder of what could have been um, obviously it's, it's a little like, it's one of those trades where I don't look back on with such like remorse because the Mets did get Johan Santana, which is good. Like there's been those other trades, like, you know, thinking about the Jared Kelnick trade where you just, yeah. cringe, you know, and uh, letting Justin Turner go like those kind of trades where you're just like, or not, not even just trades, but like moves that uh, came back to bite the Mets in the butt. Um, but with Gomez, yeah, it's like this weird, uh, connection he had to the Mets, you know, coming up as kind of a rambunctious kid and, you know, the late two thousands and then, um, yeah, almost getting him back in 2015 and like thinking about how that would have changed, like the outcome of would the Mets have made the world series with Gomez? Like, would he have been a factor? Like probably not as much as Cespedes. Um, and then I, I talked about it on the podcast yesterday, but, uh, there's like that, that tenuous connection where it's like, the Mets didn't trade Wilmer Flores and Zach Wheeler to the Brewers for Gomez. Right. So they pivoted and they traded him to the Astros. And along with him, they trade the Astros traded, uh, the Astros acquired Mike Fires, who ended up being the whistleblower for the Sun killing. So it's like in a weird way, like the Mets not acquiring Carlos Gomez and the Astros doing so, like led to the the sign stealing wow. still being uh like coming to light. So, um, but yeah, it, it really was this like bookend career as a Met for Carlos Gomez. And uh, it is kind of like nice that he got to finish his career here. Like we got, we kind of got to close the book on that and like see him play for the Mets one last time as a veteran. And he had that, that great moment. So um, it was, it's, I think it was just like, I feel fulfilled with the Gomez time in New York for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. I I didn't even know that about the fires thing. That is pretty yeah. interesting. That all the layers that can go into any of these transactions. There's always a, a bunch of different uh, butterfly effect type things that happen when any trade happens or doesn't happen. Today we are talking about Mets legends, and there might not be a bigger one than Tim Tebow. So if you're ready to discover your purpose 
and leave an impact wherever you go. Check out Mission Possible, written and read by New York Times bestselling author and former Mets farmhand, Tim Tebow, who encourages you to find your inspiration, pursue your purpose, and create a life for yourself that counts. Ignite a new spark in your life through this new inspirational listen. Mission Possible by Tim Tebow is available everywhere audiobooks are sold. Uh, and a, a recent uh, transaction that that went under the radar, I haven't talked about it yet on, on this show, is Jonas Shui Fargas coming back. And he is he is the epitome of, of a Mets legend right now, a, a legend's career unfolding before us. Uh, I don't know if he'll ever break out in a big way, but he had a cycle in, a, in the spring training game. He made some unbelievable catches last year. He's a really athletic guy. He seems like he actually really embraces being a Met. Yeah. Uh, when he he just tweeted out like blue and orange hearts, and I was like, yeah. "Is is Fargus back? Is that what he's saying?" And then like the next day, he like confirmed like back with the Mets, blue and orange hearts. So uh, it was great to see a, a Mets legend return who was only gone for I guess a couple months at the end of the season. I don't even remember what happened. I guess they DFA'd him. I think. Yeah, I mean it was. It was one of those things where, you know, it, the Mets were so thin this past year at certain points, like where they were really, really deep and digging deep into the farm system. I mean, you know, Fargus, Jake Hager coming up. Like there was that game in Miami, if you remember, where, you know, Fargus had that moment where he went for the inside the park home run and got the yeah. Um, But I feel like it was just like there were so many roster moves having to be made around that time and guys having to be cut and DFA'd and everything. Um, and I think that he just got picked up by the Cubs um, in like one of those like ro- like roster casualty moves. Um, but I'm happy to have him back. I mean, he's someone who – he's had some good moments in the field. He's fast. Like, and there's just something about him. Like he just has this like aura about him that like, I think is a little bit contagious and fans really like it. Um, and uh, I don't know, man, I just, I really like Joan Esri Fargus. He's, he's, he's an exciting guy. And, and like you said, he embraces being a Met uh, seemingly, which is not, like always really nice to see. So um, yeah, I'm a big fan, man. And I, I'm glad that he'll be back. Like, it just feels right. Like it just feels yeah. like, it just feels right that he's back with the Mets. It's funny because, you know, that was actually, if we really look back at the season, that was like the, the most fun that we had uh, last year in, in those May games where Jacob DeGrom was just on another planet and the Mets were winning a lot of games like two to one, like Taiwan Walker was great. Stroman was great at the time. And you had this team where, you know, James McCann's playing first base and Kevin Pillar is, you know, playing with a, a, a busted up face and, and they just kept winning. And then it's crazy that when they got healthy and everyone was back and then they made an addition and they had Javi Baez and Lindor playing up the middle, they can't buy a game. It's just yeah. base, baseball is crazy like that. It's very Mets. It's very Mets like if you think about it. Like it's like that telling any Mets fan that you're just like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like that, that sounds about right. It, it does, 100%. And I think another reason why uh, Jonas Shui Fargas connects with the Mets fans uh, as a Mets legend is his name. It's oh, yeah. Jonas Shui. Yeah. Uh, it's like Travis Blankenhorn. I was like, this guy is born to be a Mets legend. I hope we don't see too much of him. He, he's got to just have the perfect moment here or there to author the, the Mets legends career that we all want. So what I want to do now, I asked you to just throw some names at me, which is something that I definitely want to keep doing where each week listeners can tune in on Thursdays and just be reminded of some players of the past. So fire away, Rob. Who do you got right. for me today? All right. So when I woke up this morning, the first man that popped into my head, Gustavo Molina. <laughs> Gustav- <laughs> All right. See, now, now this is this is the great thing. Sometimes it, it harkens back and I, I'm like transported to third grade, and sometimes I'm not. Who is Gustavo Molina? I do not remember Gustavo Molina. So Gustavo Molina – Probably only played like a handful of games as a Met. Um, he was also a Yankee briefly too, but he was a catcher. I want to say in 2008 or 2009. Part of, part of the Molina <laughs> tree? I don't know if he's part of the Molina tree, but his name is Molina. So I guess he did have to be a catcher. This is God given, right? <laughs> All right. So Gustavo Molina is number one. Number two, yeah. Greg Burke. Greg Burke. All right. Another one. I don't know. It's funny. Who is Greg Burke? And lay me on, on Greg Burke. I'm sure that there's Mets, my, some of my listeners are like, oh, yeah, Greg Burke. <laughs> I, it's so funny because I had like such a vendetta against Greg Burke for like no real reason. Um, I just like didn't like him. Like I, I believe it was uh, 2011. Like I always like bunch him in my mind 
with the likes of like Scott Rice, like <laughs> like around that time. I, I'm pretty sure Greg Burke was like a side armor or like you know three quarters he threw. Um, he was just like a like journeyman reliever, like who like quad A type reliever, you know, who like was on those like really terrible Mets teams in like the early 2010s. You know what's um, great? I, I'm looking him up right now, and there's like there's there's multiple Greg Burks that come. Up. Like he's the type of guy you have to look up Greg Bird baseball or Greg yeah. Burke baseball to find out who this guy is. He's not even like the most famous Greg Burke in the world. <laughs> Four seven seven career ERA, but uh, <laughs> only two seasons. He was good with the Padres or decent, and then a, a great uh, 2013 with the Mets. Five six eight ERA. He must have come in uh, mid-season because I, I had this thing in the early like 2010s where I would watch the Mets in like April and May, and then I would pretty much quit on them from that point on, and I would just watch something else throughout the summer because I just couldn't stand it. Dude, you're you're so right though, and it's I feel like it was probably like our age at that time because we're the same age, but we were like in high school and like yeah, there's a lot going like, on. The Mets, were, the Mets were not good. So, like, yesterday I posted a video of, of Luis Hernandez hitting that home run after he broke his foot. I don't even remember Luis Hernandez. I don't remember that moment at all. Like, I, re- I know that moment from, like, having seen it, like, now. But I don't remember that moment at all. I'm like, what was I doing? I, I, I mean, it was in, like, September 2010 or something like that. The Mets were awful. So, it makes sense. Yeah. But If you were hanging around until September, you're a real good fan d- during yeah. those times. Because yeah. – it, it, there's a certain point in every season where I think uh, a level-headed Mets fan just just switches to like box score watching and, and isn't isn't as tuned into three hours of baseball every night. But the, to those of you who, who tune into the Greg Burks of the world, uh, you know, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> God, Greg Burke, he's terrible. Um, <laughs> we will have more of my conversation with Rob Pearsall in just a minute, but first I want to tell you about the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. The snack that has got me away from all those unhealthy indulgences I used to make part of my diet that would make it so much more difficult to stay in shape and to keep the weight off. So now I instead choose Built Bars, which come covered in 100% real chocolate, so it really does help you kick that sweet tooth. They come low in calories, low in sugar, but high in protein, and you can try their new Built Bar Puffs which are the first ever protein-infused marshmallows. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they're a treat that also comes covered in 100% real chocolate, and they have amazing flavors of the puffs like the cinnamon churro, the coconut marshmallow, and the banana cream pie. I personally, when it comes to the regular Built Bars, love me some cookies and cream, but there's other great flavors as well, like mint brownie, coconut, and coconut almond. If you want to try any of the Built Bar flavors today, Make sure you go to built.com right now and use the promo code LOCK15. You're going to get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. So, why endure the often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait for the person behind the counter to order your parts on their computer? choosing only the brand their warehouse happens to carry, or you might spend 30%, 50%, maybe even 100% more than if you just went to rockauto.com, which is a family business that has been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are always reliably low for every customer. So go to rockauto.com right now, see all the parts available for your car or truck, and make sure you write locked on in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need rockado.com this one will be a little bit a little bit better but he's one of my favorites ruben gotai ruben gotai all right i actually remember ruben gotai a bit that's a name that's it's ringing a bell yet i can't picture a face now i gotta and i gotta look up ruben gotai for myself so i can be uh, reminded of what he looked like i want to say 2007 he was on the yes Mets. yes uh, i remember the second smile. second baseman <laughs> uh and from what I remember, like, he was pretty good. Like, this was the days before, like, baseball savant and stuff like that. So, like, and I was, like, 12. So, I was like, oh, yeah, Ruben Gutai is good. He could have been absolutely terrible for, for all I know. Well, I can tell you right now why why you thought he was good. A, a 295 batting average. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what, that's totally it. But 351 on base, not bad. 421 okay. slugging. I mean, his OPS plus was 101. He was, he was an average player for the Mets in 07. 
Yeah, he was he was a second baseman too, you know. So he was like, he was one of those like typical like like OG second baseman that wasn't going to hit for a lot of power, but like Luis could Castilla. hit. Mm-hmm. All right, how about uh, Damian Easley? Oh, who? Okay, who would who does not know Damian Easley? Damian yeah. Easley is a, a definition of a mess legend. One hundred percent. Yeah, he was. How many years did he? I feel like he hung around for a while. He was on the wrong. he was on the Mets for at least a couple years. I know that. Like he like he was I know he wasn't on the 06 team, but he was on like one of those like six like teams right after that where like the Mets were still good but then collapsed. Like I want to say he was on like maybe like the 07 wow. Mets. Yes, you nailed it with the word collapse. He was part of both the 07 and the 08 Mets. Yeah. Part of of the biggest choke artist Mets uh ever. He also spent a couple years with the Marlins in 04 and 05. So he was part of our lives as a, as a division rival yeah. uh, early on. Utility guy, right? Yeah, he was all over Yeah, the place. he was a utility infielder. Um, he was decent, but definitely like like a forgotten like utility infielder, like veteran guy, but I feel like no one really remembers him. Like like unless you yeah. say his name and then everyone's like, oh yeah, Damian Easley. He kind of uh, followed up like Jose Valentin. Valentin was actually really good in 06, if I remember. Oh, he was great. He had, he just like – that was – I was talking about this recently. Like that 06 team, just like everything was – like everything went right, obviously, until Duan or Sanchez broke his arm or, or whatever, or collarbone in that taxi accident. But like you just had these guys. Like everyone was performing. Uh, you got, you know, Orlando Hernandez you trade from from the Diamondbacks. He is good. Xavier Nady is playing a great right field. Jose Valentin – comes in uh you know in replace of anderson hernandez is playing good um laduca like, yeah laduca, laduca was great yeah like did such a good job filling you know mike piazza's shoes because piazza left the year before um you know and then sean green comes in plays pretty well after the mets had you know had to trade xavier nady for oliver perez so um the magic ran out but uh all these guys like fill the role, you know, and, and Valentin was certainly one of them, like being 36 or whatever it was and coming in and still playing a good second base. Yeah, that, that was a, that was a great team. It always, it always like, it, it blows my mind. Cause I just remember like the, the headline of Dwyer Sanchez with the cab accident. And it wasn't until recently that I looked back and realized that the cab accident wasn't even in New York. It was in Miami. It was in Miami. Yeah. Yeah. They were. <laughs> It's like the worst, you know, he like went out late to get food or something like that and gets into a taxi accident. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, you know what? I've driven, I've driven around Miami a lot myself. It doesn't surprise me totally that he got into an accident in Miami. There's, no. there's some crazy drivers down here. Yeah. <laughs> so one last Mets legend before I go. Yes. Yes. All right. Let's dig, let's dig a little deep for this one. Um, how about Brian Dawback? Wow. See, this is another one where it's just the name is, is all that matters. But I, I don't remember Brian Dawback. I don't know how to spell. Oh, there we go. I found him. Brian. So, so he, if I remember, had like been drafted by the Mets in the 90s, had come up with them maybe in the 90s. And then I know he was with Boston for a bit. And then he made his way back to the Mets. I think he was on the team in the 05 season. Nailed it. You nailed it. Your, your memory is great. And he, he batted. uh <laughs> 120. I mean, he only had 25 at bats, but three for 25. Uh, he did hit a home run. I'm sure that's a video you guys will dig up at some point. Um, yeah. A couple doubles. Hey, you know what? The, the slugging percentage. I mean, I, I guess I guess it's not great when you're when you're uh, when you're only hitting 120. But three of his hits, uh, all the extra base hits, two doubles and a home run. The guy had some pop in his bat. I so when I was a kid, I when I was a kid until I was like in high school for a couple of years and then like kind of picked up again, like later high school, early college. But when I was a kid, I was so obsessed with the Mets. Um, and to the point where like, I would just go on the computer and this was before like social, like I had social media and stuff like this. Like I would just go on, I would just go on like Mets.com. I would just every single day, just like look at their 40 man roster. Um, and then it changed to like Wikipedia where I would just like go to each season and like look up the guy's names. But also, like, if the Mets had acquired a guy or, like, signed a guy, even, like, a Brian Dawback type type guy, I would be so excited, like, that the Mets had, like, a new player on their team. And, like, I just, like, loved it. Um, and so, like, I think that's, like, where, like, a lot of my memory of, like, these guys, like, comes from. Because I just – I remember, like, so vividly, like, when these guys came up, you know? Um, yeah. 
But Brian Dawback is one of those guys where I was like, oh, yeah, like Brian Dawback's going to be such a stud. And then he hit 120, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. And I'm sure my listeners who are, uh, you know, a lot of them maybe have been, have been Mets fans even longer. They may have a better memory of some of these guys. I know it put a smile on their face as well. If you're watching on YouTube, Rob's cat has made an appearance to close out. Yeah, it's great. He's here. <laughs> he always likes to be part of the action. That's uh, that's Daniel, my cat Daniel. I remember Daniel uh, when I came on uh, the Mets Legends podcast. I remember yep. Daniel making making a couple appearances as well. So you guys can check out uh, Mets Legends wherever you get podcasts. Go to MetsLegends.com to see the work they're doing there. Uh, follow Rob on Twitter at RT Pearsall. And then make sure you follow Mets Legends on Twitter as well. That's going to give you – uh, your best Twitter content on the Mets. When you're in a lockout, this is what you have to be looking forward to uh, or looking back to, I guess, uh, is looking at the Mets legends of the past. So thank you, uh, Rob, for joining me. And he'll be a, a regular feature of these th- Throwback Thursdays moving forward where we can continue to discuss these legends of the past. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, I'm looking forward to the Throwback Thursday episode. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. As always, Thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, review wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On Bets, hosted by your boy Q and handicap fans for Lee Sterling. Locked On Bets is where you want to go for all your daily gambling needs. You follow Locked On Bets wherever you get podcasts.